We're really delighted to be welcoming both old friends and new attendees to the Working Class Movement Library series of Invisible Histories Talks. It's a special day as we join Ben Harker, a good friend to the library, for the launch of his new book, The Chronology of Revolution, Communism, Culture and Civil Society in 20th Century Britain. It's based on a decade of research in over 20 archives, including our own, and focuses on the legacy of the Communist Party of Great Britain. The library's events are as usual free. However, we would like to encourage you to support the library if you're able to do so. And there's a donate button on our website. And today we're going to have been introduced for us by Professor Kevin Morgan, also from the University of Manchester. So thanks, Kevin, and over to you. Okay, thanks, Lynette. Um, thanks, Ben. Yes, I've been asked to say just a few words of introduction. Um, and they really will be a few words because there's such a lot to talk about um, in the book and I don't want to encroach at all on Ben's time. Um, so just a few words. I imagine that uh, many or most of us here um, will know of Ben through the wonderful book he wrote on Ewan McCall, Class Act. And if you do know that book, um, you know that Ben called it a cultural and political life. And what you get in my sense of it with the chronology of revolution is really that same sense of interplay between culture and politics, but on a very much bigger canvas, that of the party, the Communist Party itself over several decades. Um, I've just been reading it this past few days. And I mean, Lynette's just mentioned it's Ben spent a decade on it. I've just been bowled over by the amount of research that's gone into it but also how painlessly you can take in Ben's findings. Um, it's really skillfully pulled together. Um, and you can read it if you want. And in a sense, that's part of what it is as a sort of one volume history of the CP or a one volume history, at least as far as the late 1970s. Um, I imagine Ben might talk about this in a moment, but um, it goes as far as the late 70s, which I think Ben sees as almost like the party's last chance to renew itself before you go into the day, the internal turmoil of the 1980s. But so it's a one volume history, if you want to read it that way. But the point about it is that it's not just a record of events or personalities. Um, it's a critical commentary and reflection on what might have been, and perhaps what still needs to be in some sense or other, a British road to socialism or whatever you want to call it. Um, I mean, there's three points in particular that I, I would just bring out before passing over to Ben that I took from it. Um, it's a book that makes you think about a lot of things. It makes you think about the role of culture. As I say, if you've read the book on you and McCall, that's in a sense what you'll be expecting. But it also makes you think about the role of political strategy, both the strategies that the CP did adopt in the period that Ben uh, discusses, and those that it might have adopted, or those that it uh, rejected. And also, I think it makes you think about the role of party itself, by which I mean not just this particular party, but the agency of party for movements of the left. Um, if the alternatives that uh, confront us, as Ben writes, are still today as they are when the Communist Party was founded, the alternatives of socialism or barbarism. So these are important questions and the, you know, the, great, um, the great strength of Ben's book, it makes you think about the history of the party and it makes you think about these bigger questions through the history of the party. You might not agree with everything in the book, I'm not sure that I do. I'm not sure that you're actually meant to. The point is that it makes you think about these things. Um, I got a lot from reading the book these, these past few, uh, few days. I'm sure others will too. And I'm sure we will from, from Ben as he talks us through some of the issues. So I'm just gonna leave it there and pass over to Ben. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, thank you, Lynette. And thank you to the, to the library for hosting this. Um, I'd also like to thank the University of Toronto Press who've published the book and have been outstanding throughout, especially my editors there, um, Stephen Shapiro and Robin Studnerberg. The book is currently 
only out in hardback and is an eye-watering £55. Uh, you know, I am working on a, 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 getting a paperback version out and an open access version out. In the meantime, I've you know, made sure that copies of the book have been sent to the Working Class Movement Library, to the People's History Museum, and to um, the Marx Memorial Library too. So, you know, in, in the meantime, you know, you can, you can get a look, a look at it uh, there. So I'm going to talk, I'm just going to talk for about 35 minutes, I think, with plenty of slides, um, giving a sort of overview of the book. Um, and then, and then we'll open it out um, to questions. Okay. So back in 1920, um, a great deal was expected of the Communist Party of Great Britain by the Soviet leaders who inspired its formation. Leon Trotsky hoped that the new party, anchored in the world's first industrialized nation, might be the vanguard of what he called the destinies of all mankind and break the link in imperialism's chain. But far from leading the global proletariat, far from forming the vanguard of the global proletariat, the party was never even a mass party in the home of the world's oldest large, large the world's oldest labor movement. Membership, as many of you will know, peaked at 56,000 during the Second World War, towards the end of the Second World War. The party was never a significant force, theoretically or politically, in the international communist movement. It was too marginal to warrant a place in Stalin's post-war common form, and it would ne never um, share, later on, it would never share the electoral spoils of the much, la um, much larger Euro-communist parties in the 1970s. With just 8,000 members by 1989, it dissolved itself two years later. And we still await, as Kevin said, the building of the British road to socialism. Culturally, however, the party's activities always suggested a much bigger, more prominent organization. And the Working Class Movement Library itself, this wonderful library, is itself a legacy of that story, insofar as it's you know, based on a collection of you know, serious minded uh, intellectual communists and their collections of books and pamphlets. Communist cultural ambition seemed boundless. Um, let me share my screen now. Um, we go. Can you all see that? Yeah, okay. So culturally, the party was much more ambitious, very ambitious, and its intellectual seemed almost without limit. We need to breed new historians, uh, wrote the guiding spirit of the future historians group on a tour in 1936 to awaken and train them. Her protege, John Savile, echoed the stress on fixing Marxism as an integral trend in British historiography. You just see this kind of seriousness of the, this as a sort of declaration of intent here. And that mission, you know, incredibly ambitious, was sort of more or less achieved. You know, the work of communist historians, Donna Tor, Eric Hobsbawm, who we have here, Tor's here, Hobsbawm's here, John Savile's here, um, Victor Kiernan, um, A.L. Norton, um, E.P. Thompson, Raphael Samuel later. I mean, the work of these figures radically reshaped uh, British historiography, of course, and remains perhaps the party's most prestigious intellectual legacy. Communism also attracted some of the century's major writers. This, this slide makes me want to start smoking again, the sort of elegance of all these figures smoking. Um, Sylvia Townsend Warner um, here, um, Hugh McDermott, Doris Lessing, Edward Upward, Jack Lindsay, Randall Swingler, Lewis Jones, all party members, Cecil Day Lewis, Stephen Spender, briefly members. Patrick Hamilton here was moved to name his pet parrot after the long-standing general secretary, who's a pretty polit, he taught it to say. Communists also prominent, of course, in the world of theatre and film. Communist actors, playwrights and theatre workers included Joan Littlewood, this is a very young Joan Littlewood, 
photograph taken in 1934 when she first arrived in Manchester. Um, Beatrice Lehman, um, Michael Redgrave was never a member, but very close to the party in the early 40s. Tilda Swinton was in the party in the, 18, in the 1980s. The world of music, as you know, Kevin has already mentioned, um, communists established a strong presence in the world of music of various kinds. Humphrey, uh, Ewan McCall here in the middle, Humphrey Littleton, briefly a member of the party. Later, Green Gartside of Scritti Politti and Robert Wyatt, shown here. Um, can you see this or not? Oh, this, it, and he's in the way. It's okay. Um, Robert Wyatt, yeah, a, a, the drummer with a soft machine, subsequently a solo artist, of course. Pete Townsend of The Who was in the YCL. Um, Shaking Stevens was a perhaps surprising supporter. I couldn't resist putting Shaky and McCall next to one another on, on, on the same slide. And McCall would be spinning in his grave. But anyway, communist posers, composers included Alan Bush, Bernard Stevens, Christian Darton and Rutland Bowden. Communist visual artists included Paul Hogarth, Pearl Blinder, Clifford Rowe, Ern Brooks, Barbara Niven, and Ken Sprague. John Berger was very close to the party in the late 1950s and early 1960s. This is a, one of Pearl Binder's drawings for Left Review um, in the 30s. This is Realism, which is the, the journal of the Communist, Party's, um, Communist Party artist group. So John Berger wrote for the journal from time to time. Um, here we have, Barbara Niven was a very fine painter, but you know, she, she really could have, I mean, pretty much stopped painting in order to devote herself to party work and particularly work uh, to the daily worker. Um, here she is addressing a street meeting. This photograph is I like, this is a photograph from the early 60s. Oh. Communist Party Cultural, National Cultural Committee event. Um, Arnold Kettle, a literary critic here. Alan Bush, the composer. Lindsay Anderson, the filmmaker, goes on to make films like, you know, If and Oh Lucky Man and, 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 and Berger as well. Lindsay Anderson was never, was never um, particularly close to the party, but um, obviously Bush and Kettle were members and, and, and Berger was a fellow traveller and um, very close to it. Communist architects and town planners, including Bertolt Lebeckian, were central to the rebuilding of Britain after the war. This is Lebeckian here. And this is his, what is his most famous structure, not a building, a structure, the, the penguin pool in, 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 in London Zoo. Um, skeptics will tell you that the penguin pool has always been more popular with fans of modernist architecture than with actual penguins. But, um, but, but you know, the penguins seem to be having a you know, pretty nice time here. Um, the, he also, of course, builds you know, incredible, important buildings. Um, High Point One in Highgate. Um, on the left here, this is a pre-war building. Um, this is part of his um, um, Spa Green Estate in Finsbury. And this is the wonderful stairwell of uh, Bevan Court again in Finsbury. Cultural communists. So, you know, cultural communists, I'm saying, made significant interventions in terms of the arts across a very wide range of activity, but they also formed, the party formed enduring institutions for the enjoyment and intergenerational transmission of culture, like the library itself. Marx House, now the Marx Memorial Library, communists were at the sort of you know, absolutely central to the, 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 the formation of Marx House. Unity Theatres premises in central London formed the hub of a national infrastructure of sister organisations bringing accessibly priced theatre to hundreds of thousands of working people at mid-century. The Workers' Music Association, again formed in 1936, um, was incredibly important um, in terms of the promotion of working class music making and the Marxist analysis of music. And the Workers' Music Association forms its own in-house record company in 1940 called Topic Records, which is still going and is Britain's oldest um, independent record label and the Workers Music Association and Topic Records were fundamental to the post-war British folk music revival which was always a strongly communist 
Affair. This is the Penguin Book of English Folk Songs from 1959, co-edited by Vaughan Williams and, and, and the communist um, translator, poet, um, singer, um, A.L. Lloyd. Communists formed enduring, the Enduring Publishing House, Lawrence and Wishart, and it once had bookshops in most British cities and many of its towns. The party was the dynamic core of the Artist International Association in the 1930s, and also the Left Book Club in the 1930s. The Left Book Club is perhaps rather better known today. The Left Book Club has 57,000 members in Britain by 1939, organized into 1,500 reading groups. The party always, of course, took the written word very seriously. From the 19, from 1930, it has its own daily newspaper, of course, the Daily Worker. This is the first edition, and this painting is uh, and Brooks' celebration, in some ways, of, of the Daily Worker. And the party variously establishes and runs some of the key cultural, intellectual, political periodicals of the 20th century, Labour Monthly, Left Review, more importantly, Our Time, Our Time Circulation, which is 18,000 in the late 1940s, you know, it's very high, um, you know, big circulation. Marxism today, of course, becomes you know, a, a key journal, a rather divisive one, but a, a key journal not nonetheless in, in the 19, late 1970s and 80s. Communists variously formed, warranted, and influenced important non party organizations. Mass observation, for example, co formed by communist Charles Madge. Communists established a strong presence at the BBC and at the Workers' Educational Association. Communists sometimes had a reputation for being less than festive but they organized highly successful grassroots festivals, including the ones that later morphed into the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and the Notting Hill Carnival. The party tirelessly ran campaigns around educational access, equalization, the democratization of access to education, notably the long haul struggle for comprehensive education for British school children and the indomitable and rather sort of forgotten, I think unfairly forgotten, Brian Simon was a key figure here, a, a, a teacher, he was an NUS president, and then became a, you know, a sort of a historian of education and chair of the party's National Cultural Committee in the 60s. Communists, of course, always took science very seriously. Indeed, they saw Marxism as the science of society, and the party's scientifically oriented intellectuals, including Hyman Levy, JBS Haldane, insisting insistently and publicly analyzed the so-called social relations of science between the wars, taking to the airwaves, writing in newspapers, writing books and pamphlets, asking what science was, who it belonged to, what it was for, and more importantly, how capitalism and the profit motive impeded its application and social benefit. The most, communist, the most prominent communist public intellectual of the 20th century was almost certainly this man, the structural crystallographer J.D. Bernal, the so-called sage of science, whose wide ranging work across science, education, wartime planning and post-war reconstruction exercised a very powerful influence over successive governments, sometimes without them even knowing it. This painting I really like, this is one of Clifford Rose, paintings, which is the, the, the People's History Museum has, has uh, you know, dozens of these canvases in its, in its collection. Uh, and many of them, is, like this one, I think just demonstrate the sort of centrality of science to the communist imagination. There's so many paintings that he has about, of scientists at work. Um, and this is a left book club um, pamphlet um, program for an event called The Frustration of Science um, from 1938. So there's a very rich history here in terms of cultural, act, cultural activities, the cultural world, the lost cultural world of British communism. A lot of this world was marginalized or redacted during the Cold War, you know, forgotten. Sometimes those who made it were keen to forget about it. From the 1970s, important work was done restoring it to view by pioneering historians some of whom had been in the Communist Party and some of whom had not. Noreen Branson, Gary Worski, 
Stuart McIntyre early on, later Kevin, Kevin Morgan, Stephen Parsons, Andy Croft, John Callahan, David Margolis, and many others. And then, you know, subsequently, you know, more and more historians have been interested in this. Jeff Andrews, John McElroy, John Green wrote a very good book recently. Um, Joanna Bullivant, Matthew Worley, Philip Bounds, Eleanor Taylor, Evan Smith, many more could be listed. So, you know, there's historians have become interested in sort of trying to recover this lost cultural world. And I've done, as Kevin mentioned, I've done work myself in that sort of recovery vein in the past, uh, and we'll do more of it in the future. But what I wanted to do in this book, as Kevin's already said, really, was to sort of pull back a bit, you know, um, step back and take a slightly longer view and look at, the, look at that history from a different angle and try and put slightly different questions to it, you know. And in essence, what I wanted to do was to think harder about that relationship between politics and culture, rather than thinking about the cultural world of communism as a sort of, you know, a byproduct almost of its cultural activity, of its political activity, to think harder about that relationship. Um, the relationship between that, on the one hand then, the party's political objective, which was to build the revolutionary party in the Bolshevik model initially, seize the state and transform society, clearly not a success. But on the other, it's work in culture, in the narrow sense of the arts, but more broadly, in terms of civil society. You know, by that I mean, you know, after Gramsci really, those spheres of activities outside the state apparatus in the judiciary, including bits of education, the family, sport, the media, religion, science, you know, and the arts. Although culture was often seen as secondary by the party leadership, in cultural terms, the party achieved a huge amount. So this this paradox, it's that, that, that niggles all the way through, this paradox that the party often seemed to have done best, the things that its official identity and ideology valued least. That was my starting point. I'll just stop sharing that for a minute. So I began working on the book around 2000, 2007, 2008, the time of the financial crisis. Back then, as you'll all remember, even centrist economists were rereading Marx or reaching for Marx for the first time for answers. And there was a flowering of debates on the left internationally. Sometimes debates in a highly sort of abstract theoretical register about the communist hypothesis, the idea of communism, the communist horizon. These debates faced capitalism in deep and what seemed, and still seems, irreversible crisis. You know, the, the system seemed to be, to be unable to sort of jumpstart itself into a new wave of growth. And these debates asked how a version of communism might, in the words of Alain Badiou, be reinscribed into the ideological sphere. What he means by that is how, how could communism be made meaningful and imaginable at a, again at a time when it had become far easier to quote a commonplace to imagine the end of the world than the end of the capitalist system. It seemed to me then, and it still seems to me now, that these debates were very welcome, but they needed some sort of historical grounding, that they, they would have been richer by greater analysis of the failed attempts made to realize radical communist visions in the past, in the 20th century, through the communist movements and communist parties. And certainly I wanted to take issue with the basic position of Alain Badiou and others, which argued that the 20th century communist parties were simply irrelevant to us now. They were simply irrelevant to socialist strategy in the 21st century because allegedly we know all they were, that these parties were simply embryonic socialist states rotten with Stalinism. For me, despite their manifold corruptions, degenerations, tragedies and failures, the 20th century communist parties can't be brushed away so easily. I mean, they remain a very difficult but unavoidable antecedent or predecessor in anti-capitalist struggle. And they still need working through, I think, in both the everyday and the psychological sense. So the book is obviously written from an emphatically anti-Stalinist position. It argues that the concept of Stalinism was what E.P. Thompson called an ideology of a revolutionary elite, which degenerated into a bureaucracy 
that kind of concept is fundamentally necessary to analyze the party's failures. And the book does that all the way through. You know, you know the, 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 the relationship, the, 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 the way in which the, common, the party becomes at moments sort of saturated with Stalinism is a central focus of the book. At the same time, it seems to me, Stalinism isn't sufficient for grasping that failure. It can by no means explain all that these parties ever were, as we've already seen, as we've already glimpsed. The communist parties were never confined to or identical with their official orthodoxies. They were rather, as Jody Dean says, ruptured, incomplete, irreducible. And as such, she says, they remain perhaps pregnant with the unrealized potentials of the past. So the heart of the book really is thinking about that oddness, that disconnect, that paradox or excess or surplus, the way in which the parties were always at some level strangers to themselves and achieved most often in the cultural spheres that was often valued least according to the you know, sort of dominant logic. A key focus of the book is another related mismatch between on the one hand, the, the model of the party, the Bolshevized model of the Leninist Communist Party of the new type inspired by the Russian Revolution and attached to the Third International where the emphasis was, you know, the party is a sort of machine for revolution. You know, the ideal chronology is to you build the party, you seize the state, and then you transform society. So I wanted to think about the tension or mismatch between that kind of model and the Western developed capitalist countries with their traditions of representative democracy, their mass literacy, their thickly layered civil societies. These societies, of course, ultimately proved resistance to the Communist Party's incursions. No Western Communist Party made a revolution. So I see the party's failure in Britain within a larger framework structured around what I see as interlocking and inherited problems facing Communist parties in the developed West. One, a tendency to underestimate and underanalyze capitalism and the working of capitalist economies. Second, a tendency to uh, underanalyze representative democracy as a form of class rule. And thirdly, a tendency to underestimate and underanalyze the role played by culture or civil society in establishing, stabilizing, and reinforcing class rule in, develop, in developed Western societies. And I, you know, when I went back, I was finding that right back in the early 1920s, there's always a sort of ambivalence or hesitation, even sometimes a muted debate among revolutionaries, including Trotsky, about whether these Western societies, very different Western societies, with more economic, with more level, with high levels of economic development, different class compositions, different structures, different traditions, whether these different societies were going to be available for revolution in the Russian model? Was a different type of party actually necessary in these contexts? You know, that question was sort of put, but in a, in a, in a muted and restrained way. The Bolshevik Leninist model prevailed and it prevailed for very good reason, given the immense prestige of the Soviets who had after all broken through and made a revolution. But a consequence, I think, was that the British party had a tendency to marginalize or deny what some of its own activists were also saying right from the beginning, that it might need to think more, more and differently about the role of culture and civil society in class rule, that these were societies where culture mattered more in shaping consciousness amenable to capitalism, and that here wider cultural struggle and different types of cultural interventions might be needed to weaken that rule. Changing the culture might, in other words, be a precondition of revolutionary advance rather than an effect of it in these contexts. So the book unearths often through, you know, quite a lot of archival digging, unlicensed initiatives, formations, what I call cultural countercurrents within British communism. These countercurrents are sometimes listened to by the leadership, sometimes marginalized, but they struggle to define civil society and culture as a, as a significant location of politics and, and work in that sphere as a crucial precondition for advance. So I, you know, I, 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 I recover and analyze the thought of you know, diverse figures, some well-known, some forgotten, including Sylvia Pankhurst, 
Frida Utley, Tom Wintringham, Edgel Rickwood, Jack Lindsay. Jack Lindsay is a sort of key figure in the book in many ways. Bill Warren. Also, later, Gramscian feminists like Beatrice Cam Campbell. These figures, it seems to me, form, you know, collectively form a you know, significant countercurrent or countercurrents within the party at different moments and in different ways. These figures think through the relationship between cultural work and more obviously political practice. They sporadically unsettle and sometimes directly challenge the opposition between culture and politics as official communist orthodoxy tended to understand it. So I'm interested in that sort of churn or theoretical dissonance, I call it, you know. Um, debates and splits about what the party should do in the cultural world and in civil society and how that, that how work in those spheres might relate to activities in, 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 you know, on the industrial front and on the political front. Now, you know, on the one hand, this might be, all this might be sort of brushed aside as infighting, you know, as kind of splits and schisms and divisions within what is already a pretty small party. But actually, I think these divisions matter and they remain live because here a different party with a broader sense of the field of politics was struggling to be born, was struggling to sort of prefigure some sort of alternative. And I present this lost countercultural history as a small but significant archive for analysis in terms of debates about the form and function of the radical party, the radical socialist party in the present and indeed in the future. So the book, let's talk about the book a little bit now. The book combines political theory, historiography, analysis of key documents and cultural moments. I structured it chronologically, you know, with five long chapters divided into subsections where particular debates, episodes and spheres of work are analysed. So let me just sort of talk a little bit about some of the things that I that I that I I, I, I look at. Um, OK, hang on. I just got to go back into it. It's not letting me move through the slides now. Um, okay, so one of the things that I'm interested in, I've already suggested this when I talked about Brian Simon is communist and education, communist and work in the sphere of education, um, especially communist attitudes to um, children and school education. Here we see communist pioneers in the 1920s down with the baby starvers greeting from the pioneers of the USSR. In 1949, there were 2,000, 2,000 teachers in the Communist Party. 5% of the total membership of the party is teachers. 1% of teachers in the entire country are at that point in the party. So I, you know, I analysed that in various ways. And, and as I mentioned, this sort of long struggle for comprehensive education. I'm also very interested in organisation on campuses in a period of university expansion, especially after the war. The NUS, the, the, the Communist Party has a series of NUS presidents, the first of which is Brian Simon. Here we, on the left here, we see the Cambridge University Socialist Club on the march in the late 30s. Uh, the, 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 the Cambridge University Socialist Club has a thousand members in, in 1939 or 20% of the entire undergraduate cohort at Cambridge. So one in five Cambridge undergraduates at, in that year um, are in a, an organization which is effectively run by the party. I'm also interested in science, and especially in the chapter on the 50s, I talk quite a lot about how scientific advance brings, how scientific advance in the Soviet Union, I should say, brings prestige to the party when the towing, when the going is getting very tough indeed. You know, here you see um, activists in Ilford with their placard, give the Tories the rocket, demand a general election now, you know, deriving, you know, um, benefit, you know, through association with with um, Sputnik and the Soviet uh, lead in the space race. And the poster here is showing the 1962 uh, annual fundraiser for the daily worker. But again, you, you know, you see the sort of, the, the, the rocket is central, what becomes central to communist iconography 
of the period and the way in which the communist movement is trying to sort of clearly, you know, align itself with scientific modernity itself. Gender is a key issue all the way through. Um, the book analyzes positions on the sexual division of labor, on the family, and the challenge that feminists mounted in the 1970s to the dominant assumption in the party for a, a, lot, a long time that feminism divides the working class and therefore isn't a good idea, and that patriarchy is somehow a superstructure of capitalism that will wither away when capitalism itself is taken care of. And of course, feminists insisted that patriarchy had to be confronted here and now, including in the party's own practices. So these, this is a, a women's delegation to the Soviet Union um, from the late 1920s, organized by the wonderful newspaper, The Sunday Worker, which I write about quite a lot in the first chapter. This is Homefront, the women's journal um, that the party produces during the Second World War. Um, this shows a communist party um, pageant in which communist party activists in the early 70s are um, enacting, you know, um, the work of their forebears in the, in, in the struggle for women's rights. And we see here on the right a communist party poster advertising a women's event from 1975. I also analyzed debates on sexuality. Um, and some of this is rather more familiar than it was 10 years ago because of the film Pride. But, you know, here we see, this is Mark Ashton, who's the main character in, in that film Pride, which is a film celebrating the, uh, the, 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 the solidarity between the elements of the lesbian and gay community and the, and, and, and the NUM during the 84, 85 minus strike. So um, this is Pits and Perverts. This is the poster um, of the famous Pits and Perverts con concert headlined by the Bronsky Beat, lesbian and gay communists, uh, uh, a, a, a pamphlet by the um, London district of the party. I, I'm also, you know, very interested in attitudes to race in the party and empire and colonial legacy. The party's struggle to transform itself with the integration of black activists, including the outstanding Claudia Jones, arguably the best leader the Communist Party never had, and to grasp the changing dynamics of race and class at mid-century. I an analyze Mrs. Um, Jones's excellent paper at the West Indian Gazette. This is a demonstration after the Notting Hill riots and the attacks on the black community uh, in Notting Hill in 1958. And this is Jones herself. Um, I also analyze Is attitude to mass culture, especially American mass culture, an attitude that could sometimes be rather sort of phobic in terms of the party's response to a, what it called the, the, the penetration of American culture, what we would now call cultural imperialism. Um, I like this piece, it's kind of small photographs, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting one. So the film is Mighty Joe Young, which was a fairly bad, um, you know, King Kong spin off movie. But um, the party, party activists have defaced it, as you can see, with the words, you know, Yankee culture. And this photograph is trying to capture the uh, responses as, of passers-by as they take in both the poster and the defacement. And the communists were very active and very successful, actually, in organizing campaign, challenging the uh, spread or the, the importing of, of um, what they saw as very lurid and violent um, American comics aimed at children, obviously, in the early 1950s. And this, this, this the, the comics pamphlet is part of that, part of that campaign. I'm interested in music. I'm, in, I'm, I'm interested in youth culture. Um, the left here, this is the famous front cover of Challenge from December 1963 with the Beatles on the front. Not surprisingly, the best-selling issue of Challenge ever by some, by some margin. And I, I track the way in which the party um, formulates or uh, arrives, eventually it arrives at a, a sort of Gramsci influenced um, model for the analysis of, of popular culture, popular music. This is a Gramsci conference, looks fantastic lineup from 1977. And um, Gramsci is, in the book, you know, prominent, prominent in the book, in terms of I'm, I, I'm interested in the processes through which Gramsci's thought comes, Gramsci's writing 
comes to be translated. It, it's, it, the translations are blocked at various moments and then permitted. And, and, and that, so I'm interested in that process, uh, the involvement of Brian Simon's brother, Roger Simon, Simon in particular, to getting trans Gramsci's work translated, but also the way in which that those writings then amplify what I've been calling theoretical dissonance when, you know, when, when communist activists can, you know, really get to read the prison notebooks, especially in the early 1970s. Gramsci said that to write the history of the party, one in fact needs to write the general history of the country. To write the history of the party's work in civil society, I think one also needs by definition to write a history of that nation's civil society. And as Kevin said, I mean, on the one hand, the book is a, a sort of internal account. It's a thickly footnoted institutional history of the Communist Party's cultural networks, committees, personnel, interventions, and structures. You know, so I try to detail it. And the book is the book tracks very carefully, or closely at least, um, the, the work of the National Cultural Committee. But I didn't just want to write a sort of inward account of the party's sort of cultural work. I wanted to write a book that looked outwards towards civil society. So the book is really about the interface between the party and the broader culture. Um, a, a broad culture, of course, which is undergoing rapid transformation in the, in, in, in the mid and late 20th century. And often this interface was a matter of what was not seen. Often, that is, the party shares more with the common sense of mainstream British culture than it would have owned or liked, especially around attitudes to patriarchy, attitudes to race and empire, attitudes to intellectuals and intellectualism, and attitudes to cultural values. What's the relevance of all this now? Why should we care? I mean, the book is structured around a few key propositions. One, um, that Kevin's already mentioned, uh, that, and I probably don't need to gloss this too much in a talk at the Working Class Movement Library, but, but you know, that we need socialism more than ever. Second, some version of the party form, you know, remains indispensable to democratic socialist ad advance. And thirdly, the existing party forms through which socialist movements work are, self-evidently, I think, too narrow in their range of operations and ambitions to break through in developed mass societies. Raymond Williams, it seems to me, was right, as he often was, back in 1975. He says the systems and meanings and values which a capitalist society has generated have to, have to be defeated in general and in detail by the most sustained kinds of intellectual and educational work. Seems to me that that's even truer now than it was then. As Wolfgang Streeck argues, 40 years of neoliberalism have effectively hollowed out democratic structures and collective bargaining processes, shifting the ideological burden of organizing everyday life from macro to micro, from institutions to culture. So culture in that sense, it seems to me, matters more in the work that it does in the creation of consent for capitalism and in closing down the ability to imagine alternatives to it. It follows that we need a radically expanded conception of the political party. This needs to be, I think, attuned to and able to integrate mutually reinforcing work in the spheres of the, the economic, the industrial, the political and the cultural. Much of 20th century communism has now passed into history, but around this question at least, around the quest of what Gramsci calls the modern prince, you know, the modern communist party, the modern socialist party, the communist party of Great Britain's exceptional failure still I think has lessons to teach us. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much indeed. You have covered a wide range of, of uh, topics there. We've, we've had education, colonialism, gender, and indeed penguins, which I think is a first for, for our talk series. So, so thank you for that. Um, I am going to open it up now for questions and remember to let you do, uh, let people be able to unmute yourselves. Right, you should now be able to do that. So would anyone like to wave at me to ask a question? If you want to put it in the chat, um, that's absolutely fine. But if you would like to give me a wave. Yes, John, 
Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Um, well, that was a great, fascinating talk by Ben. I was really pleased to welcome his book, and I look forward to reading it avidly. Um, it's ironic because when I when I wrote my own uh, book, The Untold Story of Communists, I was it was out of desperation because there was so little written about the Communist Party in terms, certainly in terms of its um, contribution to culture. So I'm so pleased that Ben has taken that forward and mine was inadequate and, and, and done on the spur of the moment. And I think here from what Ben said in his talk, uh, we're going to have a much more comprehensive analysis uh, here of the Communist Party's contribution. Um, so what I'd like to ask Ben is interesting, the fascinating idea that the Communist Party made such a contribution to culture on all sorts of levels, yet the, there was a contradiction between the attitude of the leadership towards its cultural figures. There was a mistrust, they were seen as dangerous intellectuals, and the cultural contributions they were making and that could have made with, with more support from the party were not there. Um, does he feel there's, there's uh, specific reasons for that? Or is that typically, I mean, for instance, in the French Communist Party, it was very different. They, they didn't seem to need or want to control their artists to toe the party line, as happened in Britain. I don't know, is that, a, um, it's just for me interesting that we made such a contribution as communists, yet, yet it was never really recognized by the leadership. You want me to respond now, Lynette, or are you going to take a few questions? Okay, great, John. Well, thank you. I've, I've never met you, but it's great to see you. Uh, and I, you know, I, I loved your, I loved your book and learned a huge, huge amount from it. You know, um, fantastic. Um, I read it with great interest. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a big question. Um, clearly, there are there are a lot of re I mean, there are a lot of reasons why intellectuals in the party were marginalised, and, and they weren't all, always marginalised. And I, what I didn't want to do in, in the book was set up some sort of, you know, crude opposition between the sort of good guys and the bad guys. You know, I mean, I, there, there, there is no pure sort of, you know, unsolid sort of countercurrent in British communism that is, you know, uh, you know that, that it isn't touched by Stalinism, for example, you know, um, people people that we're very drawn to, and you know, uh, people like Edward Rickford, you know, wrote, wrote glowingly about Stalinism at various moments. That was just part of the party's, you know, party's identity at those at, at, at that interwar moment. Jack Lindsay, you know, um, is taken in by and defends the show trial. So even the people who seem, you know, most sympathetic, perhaps in some ways, to sort of, um, you know, modern readers, you know, perhaps need to be, you know made aware or remain aware of, 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 of that. But there's certainly, there's certainly, an, there's, there's an anti-intellectualism in the, in the party that seems to me to actually mirror the broader culture, you know, in this sense, you know, there's a mistrust of people getting um, above themselves and taking themselves too seriously. And in, in that sense, the party has more, you know, in common with the, the, the more, you know, with, with the mainstream of society than, than it, it, it would have liked. And there's also obviously, a strong class dynamic to this, especially early on, in that intellectuals tend to be, um, you know, university educated and um, from uh, more privileged backgrounds. And for good reason, the party is emphatic that it is going to be, you know, a, a proletarian party. That, that is its identity and its leadership is going to come from, the, from that strata of society. So th those, are, those are some of the reasons why I think intellectuals are marginalized and that that changes obviously in the 60s and 70s when you have the sort of throughput of intellectuals who are often the children of um young people who've often grown up in their party so they're part that their parents are communist um but they themselves are from you know um not necessarily from privileged backgrounds and they're much more difficult to dismiss as sort of ivory tower privileged intellectuals and, and those figures gain some traction in that very different context of the of, of the 60s and 70s. Thanks, thanks John, thanks Ben, I'm glad you to introduce you to each other. Um, Mike Sanders has raised his hand, Mike. Hello Ben, that was a, a fabulous talk and thanks as always to the Working Class Movement Library for organising it. I wanted to ask briefly about that moment where the CP uh, bolshevises itself um, under kind of 
the influence of the of the communist international and that wasn't an uncontested process within the within the cpgb and i just wondered do any of your um counter-cultural figures your, your counter-current figures are they at all involved in that with that wing of the with this with that wing of the cpgb that is skeptical about the bolshevization of the british party yeah, thanks, Mike. It's, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Yeah, the answer is yes. I mean, there are a lot of the parties at that moment, um, you know, much more diverse. Its publications are much, um, 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 a pitch much broadly, and all that is narrowed in the interests of Bolshevization. And, and what I wrote most about in the book in relation to that is, is the way in which the party's attitudes to workers' education, adult education, are, are sort of instrumentalized and, and, and narrowed in that con context. And some you know, really interesting figures like Mark Starr, who's sort of interested in Esperanto, for example, and a lot of the figures who are involved in adult education, the Horobins, um, 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 Eden and Cedar Paul, you know, that, that, they're really interesting figures, you know, from the 20s, you know, they, they sort of, you know, they depart, they, they part company from the party in and through that process of Bolshevization. And I, and I present the sort of Sunday, I mentioned the Sunday working newspaper, I sort of present that really as almost a sort of utopian space where this much broader party sort of, you know, survives in after, after the fact of Bolshevization. But yes, I mean, the, 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 the adult education is, is, is where that ha happens most strongly and some outstanding cadre, um, you know, are, are leave the party at that point precisely because they, they, they think that the party is being uh, narrowed into a machine for revolution and that, and, and that broader kinds of strategies are going to be needed in developed, uh, you know, developed Western contexts. The, 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 Eden and Cedar Paula, I think, especially fascinating. You know, they basically say, of course, a key contradiction in capital is the relationship between socialized production and private ownership but they say that in developed societies there's also this new paradox that workers are having to be educated to a certain level to operate you know complicated uh, machinery op op operate com com complicated technology and this affords the opportunity you know they have to be educated to quite a high level to do this and of course this is going to enable them to see through capitalist ideology and therefore work in adult education is absolutely crucial. So that's a really interesting debate that plays out around the time of the Bolshevization moment that you that you, you rightly identify as being a sort of key a key point in the terms of the party's shifting self definition. Thank you, Ben. A couple of uh, questions have come through on the chat. The first one: a paradox. The vote, the folk song movement, with its often universal stories of working class life has been relatively shunned in the Morning Star while the more individualistic jazz features regularly. Any thoughts? You need to unmute yourself then. I just want to read that question. It's an interesting one. Um, is it here? Uh, I think it just came to me. The way I set it up, I can, I can try and... No, it's fine, it's it fine. To... Yeah, I, I can't really comment on the sort of editorial um, line of the of, 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 of the Morning Star, um, but um, but I think there's always been there's always been an anxiety amongst the communist movement that folk music is sort of very old fashioned. You know, this this was happening in, in you see this in, in the 1960s. Um, this is one of, you know again a, a paradox right of that moment. On the one hand, the Communist Party are scratching around for cultural spheres in which in which it has real influence, um, and the obvious place where it has real influence, huge influence, is in the in the folk song movement, which at that point has you know um, hundreds of clubs up and down the country. You know the, some of the major intellectuals, the leading the leading lights, McCall, um, A. L. Lloyd, are communists. But the Communist Party's Cultural Committee is nervous of making that into a central plank of its cultural identity and policy. And you can see why the party wouldn't want to be, appear to be sort of you know, backward looking or nostalgic in, in that way. So I think all the way through, there's been a, a tendency to sort of um, underestimate um, or, or an, an, an uncertainty around what to do with um, the legacy of folk music. McCall and and many of the others, you know, get very frustrated with this. And, you know, there's a whole, there's a big split from um, party 
folk music activists towards Maoism. That's a different story in, in the 60s. But they feel that the party at that moment should be taking folk music much more seriously, should be making it central to its cultural policy. And their frustration that it isn't doing so is, you know, an important, it's not the only reason, but it's an important reason why there's that split to, why there's that split to, um, why there's that split to Maoism. Um, Kevin Morgan has written superbly. And, um, you know, I, I was, I was very indebted to his stuff in terms of the way in which the party is very successful uh, in terms of organising amongst, you know, especially amongst dance band musicians in the war. You know, I mean, dance band musicians are a sort of interesting group, right? They tend to be sort of proletarian background, many of them. They're not very well paid. Their employment is incredibly insecure. And in, you know, in, in the 30s and 40s, every night they are, you know, witnessing the, the rich at their leisure. So, I mean, they, they, they really are seeing the ruling class, you know, they're seeing the whites of their eyes, you know, uh, every night. And, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not surprising that, you know, that, that proves to be a very fertile ground for uh, recruitment for the party, especially in the 40s. Interesting. Uh, thanks to Shirin for, for another question. Uh, she, like I, uh, like your description of Claudia Jones as the best leader the Communist Party never had in Britain. Uh, she says, in the context of Black Lives Matter, it seems shocking that the CP overlooked or kept out Jones in the way they did in Britain. Why do you think they responded to her in this way? Well, it's a good question. And, you know, when I went back and looked at it, um, the Special Congress of 1957, which is a sort of crisis moment in the party's life, of course, when it's dealing with the aftershocks of 1956, Jones goes to the conference floor and she, she tears into Emile Burns, um, the part, one of the party lead, leaderships, for the language that he uses uh, when describing the, you know, so-called backward people is, is the phrase that he uses. So she, she tears into him uh, and she tears into the Communist Party's attitude to um, its former colonies. And, you know, from that moment on, really, you know, she's, she's, she's unlikely to make it into the top tiers of the party life. She simply refuses to kowtow to, to uh, these, uh, what she would see as, you know, uh, old men. Uh, and um, she, she is, you know, marginalised. Um, she's very outspoken and, you know, that doesn't play well. And she's, you know, she's sort of marginalised. Uh, in terms of the work she does, and, and it's an immense loss to the party, of course, because she, you know, what she does at the West Indian Gazette and what she does in terms of organising the early, early carnivals is exactly what the party, you know, needs to be doing. But um, you know, they, they've, they've, you know, marginalised and alienated, you know, the, the, a key figure, you know, who was sort of, you know, very well placed to in, make that happen. Um, Jones was, you know, immensely, immensely impressive. As, as as an activist um, and I do think I mean I, I do have a I, you know, I, this does get my goat a bit as well the way in which Jones is often sort of appropriated as a sort of forerunner of a certain sort of identity politics that's often the way that she's presented you know Jones you know she was a Marxist and she you know she moves to Maoism later on but she remains you know communism remains absolutely central to her to her identity all the way through and that sort of structural analysis is always there in her work and it's that that makes it so powerful but yes I mean it's 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 um I mean I, I like quite a lot a lot about you know this in the book the way in which the party struggles to um yeah to, to transform itself you know to be open to that kind of transformation in the context of uh, of of um you know the, the black community uh, in 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 in, in, in the 50s and 60s. And of course, you know, it then leaves itself very uh, easily outflanked by black power when it comes along, you know, of course. We, we've spent some time reshaping our hall displays uh, during lockdown period, and you'll be pleased to hear that uh, Claudia Jones now features in our hall cabinets. Uh, so we have a question from Jeff. Were there any attempts to challenge the crude anti-Americanism of the attacks on Yankee culture? Yes, there were some, but um, but it but it was it was it was uh, it was rather a, a, a muted um, marginal affair. Um, that's a sort of paradoxical moment, right? The Communist Party, you know. That campaign has real traction, you know. There's a lot of anxiety in the culture about Americanization at that point. The Communist Party are used to its campaigns not being particularly resonant, and there's something about that campaign. The BBC, you know, you know, 
very anti-American, you know, at, at, at mid-century, and, and 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 so that there's a way in which that that sort of atmosphere makes the broader culture open to communist argument, and I think that also makes it difficult to 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 put a more skeptical view forward because the party is clearly making some headway in some of those campaigns in a way that it in a way that it often wasn't. Someone like Mervyn Jones is you know is, is very critical of that, but it's it's also it is very widespread that that anti-American analysis. J.B. Priestley sort of criticizes it as well, of course, from outside the party. Um, but but it, it's 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 surprising how little resistance there was to that to that turn for sure in the context of the British road and the anti-Americanism as a sort of cultural logic of 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 the British road. Could you tell us a bit more about the block on the translation of Gramsci's work? Yes, well, it, we, 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 get, we, get, we get the translation, of course, of the modern prints, uh, which is a, you know, a rather slender uh, selection from Gramsci's writings in 1958, so much earlier on. And as I sort of say in the book, it's, it's interesting that the party don't really... The, the, the reception of Gramsci within the party at that point is quite narrow. The party doesn't sort of almost know what to do with Gramsci. And, and at that point, the new left are becoming very interested in, in the writing of Gramsci and commissioning translations of Gramsci. But there's various back backroom maneuvering that, you know, there's that basically, I mean, the, the top brass of the party aren't keen on Gramsci's selected um, prison notebooks being translated. They, they, they have a sense that, that, that that is going to cause more sort of theoretical ruction. So there's a lot of toing and throwing, which I sort of track in the book. And, and Roger Simon, Brian Simon's brother is a, is a key figure. Eventually, he ends, he ends up stumping up a lot of his own money to get the prison notebooks translated through Lawrence and Wishart when they come through in the early 1970s. And of course, at that moment, and this is quite well known, a people like Jeff Andrews has written really very well about this, but Gramsci becomes, those texts become a kind of rallying point for a certain kind of critique of, you know, the party's identity and, and, and priority. So it's, you know, um, those prison notebooks arrive. I mean, almost 50 years after the event, really, you know, they're written in, you know, like the very early, you know, very, very early 30s, and they're not translated until the early 70s. So their they're, 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 they're English reception is, you know, is, is, is much delayed. Thanks, Ben. I, uh, although I've tried to reset the chat so that everybody can see the questions, they're still just coming through to me. So I've just I've just cut, pasted a couple of comments from from John Green so that you can all see them. If anyone, you're still welcome to use the chat, and I will I will read out your question. But if anyone would like to wave to me to unmute yourself to ask a question, I will scroll through. Yes, Eleanor, hi. Would you like to unmute? Right. Yep. Can you, um, yep. The Communist Party you have described is very different the one than the one that I know or knew as well, because my mother was a very uh, active communist from about 1939. And what you're talking about cultural things, but her, her role, well, when she joined the party, the first thing she was told was that she had to spend at least half of her time and other organizations, not the party. So she took on the role of uh, talking to women's guilds, uh, uh, women's guilds all in Bristol. I mean, she then, uh, uh, I'm talking about socialism and all sorts of other things. And then she also then got very involved in the co-op, the Bristol Cooperative Society, and uh, was, was on the co-op board and influencing things there. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think that the, the Communist Party was trying to educate people. Very, that, that was really their role. Of my mother saw her role as actually educating people as to what we wanted and, and what the, you know, and, and that role. So, yes, she was also, I mean, she was interested, first of all, even before, I think before she joined the party, she was actually in the Left Book Club. And she was also went on and performed in Unity Players, I think, just about the time of the war. So there was, that was also a cultural thing. But I think 
more work and a lot of effort was went by her certainly was to go and talk to people about about things you know about about what socialism what what communism was and all the rest of it so uh, yes i think that that was another big sphere of the party work was to educate people not just in cultural terms but in education yes that's right and i you know i i i, I talk about that a lot in the book and yeah it's, it's really interesting to hear when did your mom join eleanor I think about 1939, I'm not quite sure, um, or 38, she certainly, I've got her diaries and I've been going through them, and uh, certainly the first thing I've got in 1938 is she went along to the left book club, but then, but then she, so sometime around that time, my father was already in the party because um, he'd been a Marxist at Oxford, <laughs> and uh, that's so, but that's so that influenced her as well, but she, she had been, I think, in the Labour Party that but anyway that would have been about 1939 to 1940 something like that but I say during um during the i mean during the war there wasn't too much of that obviously um, but she then as i say eventually became chair of the west of england district i'm not quite sure when that started but in the 60s well in the 60s 50s um but uh, but certainly before that she got herself even before that, she got herself very involved with the women's guilds. In fact, I'd go through a diary, she'd often go to her own guild, she'd give a talk nearly every week at another guild, um, at hundreds of, all about socialism, really sort of introducing themselves to the idea of what is capitalism and what is, you know, what, what we want different and all sorts of things. Did you okay. leave the party? Did you leave the party? No. Nope. No, when she 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 stayed in the party and joined the CPB. Right when she when uh, the party dissolved. No, no, she was she was still never never left the party. Neither did my dad either. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I that, yeah, it's wonderful. It's very interesting. I haven't, it's not, you know, I'm really got a comment, but just thanks for sharing it. And it would be good to, uh, you know, some those diaries need to be archived somewhere when you when you've. <laughs> Well, no, 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 no they're, they're going to be archived. I, I mean, I've decided already in half of these ones have already gone. Um, my my mother's name was Ivy and her great granddaughter is named in Canada is named Ivy. And so we thought that they ought to have the archive because it's not the, 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 the diary isn't all about the party, but in the part in the but I've made a list of things and I'm sort of thinking about how I cope with that. But still, <laughs> the number of meetings should go is phenomenal. But I first start, anyway, a no more. <laughs> Thanks, Eleanor. Is anybody else wanting to wave at me? Yes, Pat. Do you unmute yourself? Can you see the unmute button? Okay. There you go. Uh, I'd just like to ask um, you whether you spent any time looking at the work of the uh, party's economic advisory committee, um, which um, I was a member of uh, during the 70s. And um, one of the issues that was uh, hotly debated was the question of inflation, uh, what caused it, what policies should be adopted to deal with it. The chair of the committee was the then industrial organiser, Bert Ramelson, uh, who loved uh, an argument and encouraged uh, the debates within the committee, but did his utmost to stop the arguments from going beyond the committee into the wider party. And so it was difficult to get uh, lines that were different from the official line on these issues published in the party press. I wondered if you'd looked at any of that. Yes, thank you, Pat. I, I, it's, it's good to see you. Yes, uh, yes, I do a lot. I mean, I, I, the, the, the chapter on the 70s, I mean, there's, there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of analysis of, of exactly that and, and your work, your contributions, and Dave Purdy's pamphlets as well, um, you know, the work that he writes, um, Mike, prior um, these figures seem to me to be you know hugely important in terms of crystallizing a certain kind of critique later on and I also talk about the the oddness really of the fact that the communist party which is subscribing to you know an economic 
theory of history after all has no economics committee at all until 1943 and and between 1943 and the, and the moment you're describing in the, from the mid 60s onwards things start to heat up right but in that period i mean there's very little sort of serious analysis going on of the actually existing capitalist economy the long boom it happens in a big flurry at the end of the 60s and as you say when when it does come it, at that point it's, it's extremely divisive you know um when you get these other positions but that is a striking sort of aporia or gap within the party's own work that there's just a confidence that capitalism is sort of you know crisis prone and um and, and you can see at the moment that the party is founded in the 1920s there's every reason to assume that that's the case but of course the majority of the communist parties three score and ten a phrase that kevin used you know, coincides not with a period of wars and revolutions, but with the longest sort of economic boom in capitalist history. And the parties, the belatedness of the parties grappling with that is a sort of key key theme of the book. And it was really interesting to go get, as you say, to go through the economic advisory um, committee's documents in the, in, in, in the People's History Museum and track that through. And, and also, I mean, a lot of that is played out what in um, the comments that are fed in, in in the rewriting of the British Road to Socialism in 1977, in, 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 in publications like Comment, you get a, a, quite a lot of that, a lot of that analysis coming, coming through, and in you know, Dave Purdy's um, Out of the Ghetto book. Yeah. Well, thank you. I look forward to reading the chapter in the book. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. Uh, so I've got one more question from from uh, Jeff. This may be the last question, um, unless anybody is going to pop up for me. So uh, we, I think we're winding towards the end. If you if you got something you're desperate to ask please do get ready as it stands here we go is there ever a moment when cp leadership adopts a bold policy supporting a new culture initiative it looks as though it is always suspicious of giving the cultural types too much support lest things go out of control well i i, I write a lot about you know the moment of the popular front period when this kind of work does come to the forefront of, um, of, 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 of the party's work and where people like Edgell Rickwood are suddenly sort of taken very seriously. There's a sense in which the party has to um, broaden its field of operations. It has to, you know, uh, adopt some sort of story about the, uh, adopt some sort of narrative about the, about the national story and national destiny that's resonant and meaningful given you know the analysis is clearly what that you know fascists are you know territorializing the nation and and and, and if, the, if the left just steps back from that ground then that is going to be da disaster so the, the left have to sort of move on to the you know the territory of the nation the, the nation the, na the nation and national culture and at that moment and that's when we get this sort of incredibly incredible flowering of communist party cultural work i mean all these institutions you know unity theater and the workers music association the artists international association the left book club journals like left with you i mean all of that you know is happening in that sort of you know really 30 you know 36 37 38 period when george orwell writes in 1939 that he says in the last five years english literature has more or less fallen under communist control i mean he's exaggerating as orwell always did but he's not exaggerating by that much. I mean, there's something in what he says. What he's really talking about is the way in which communism has managed to sort of establish a very powerful presence in terms of in terms of the national culture. So, in answer to Jeff's question, um, that that would be that would be that would be right. I also just want to, I just saw in the chat. I think John Green had added a comment about um, Americanized. I mean, John, John Green's you know quite right to say you know the par party wasn't sort of phobic about American culture per se it was it was it was what it saw as a sort of um that culture which seemed to be pushed towards Britain as a sort of you know martial plan in the field of ideas it was called it continued to celebrate people like Lopes and people like Woody Guthrie um you know and and, and American writers all the way through that period it was never it was never it was never anti-American in, in its kind of narrowly sort of national sense but there was a certain kind of shine what Hoggett calls sort of shiny barbarism it was that uh, Hollywood uh, that was being that was being resisted and challenged okay oh gosh I'm just 
popping in now. A couple of a couple more things. Right, are you okay to carry on, Ben? But you're obviously yeah. you, you, your your audience is is keen to hear more. more. Um, so now I'm going to I'm going to read this this shorter one. I was I was wondering if you can add something on Euro communism. In the book, you call it the spectre of Euro communism. Well, I talk about a, a spectre of Euro communism sort of yeah, haunting the party and then arriving, you know, uh, with a thump really in the 1970s. So I, 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 I talk about I talk about those um, splits uh, that that um, come around journals like Euro Red uh, when the you know, European Communist parties are, cons are, are, are making ground and how that accentuates the yeah, divisions that have all, always always been there in the in the in in in, in the party around you know, attitudes to nation and culture and uh, democratic strategy socialist strategy I, I mean i didn't i mean i didn't really just want to rehearse the sort of you know more familiar position you know that you know other, other historians have you know written very well about that in people including people like you know willie thompson back in the day and jeff andrews more recently but i but yes i'm, I'm interested in some of those figures that, that, that are immersed in that. Monty Johnson seems to me, he, he never called himself a Euro communist, but again, he's somebody who, who I'm very interested in through the book. I mean, we managed to get Monty Johnson's papers catalogued as part of the HRC project that supported the book. And Johnson's writings around the European parties, you know, seems to me to be very important. And I, and I, I give a lot of airtime to his, to, his, to his views in the book. But I'm also interested in that chapter on the 70s, I'm very interested in which there's this sort of, again, quite an extraordinary sort of rejuvenation of the Communist Party's cultural work. A lot of those committees and groups that have been moribund for years are suddenly sort of revitalised. And there's this sort of, you know, and the Communist University of London, of course, becomes a kind of really important venue for uh, analysis on the left in the 1970s. Including Euro communist currents, but not but but not only those. So I track that through, and I'm I'm also very, yeah very interested in tracking through the National Cultural Committee's documents that this this resurgence of you know grassroots often um, cultural activity in seventies Britain, you know, including things like you know Voices magazine, you know, magazines of you know working class writing that are that are being produced out of the Manchester office in the seventies um, as a sort of late flowering. Um, of, of of this this kind of cultural work in the party in the context of Euro communism for sure. Right, thank you. Right, so here's our new last question. Um, this is from Gregory. I'll, I'll read it out. Uh, like many others, he said how much he's enjoyed the talk. The party's cultural work arguably peaked during the Popular Front. Is there an argument that the party was at its most successful when it both reflected native English and in inverted commas populist sentiments? and transmitted an alternative view of Britain beyond solely talking to themselves. Why did it fail to continue this later into the post-war period? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. I mean, I, one of the things that I try to say in the book is actually that, of course, the 30s matters. And, and, and there's a sort of, you know, a, a kind of um, celebrity, a bit of kind of celebrity stardust the party's cultural work in the 1930s when you have these very eminent fellow travellers but but really it's the wartime conjuncture it's the wartime moment that the party seems to be you know getting real getting real traction you know and I, and I have a long chapter on the book dealing with that the, these these positions take forward that popular front position um, about you know defending the nation but you have this extraordinary moment of the Anglo-Soviet alliance where communists are completely obviously animated by um, by the alliance uh, and uh, the prestige again to use that word again that the Soviet Union is accruing in you know beating back fascism militarily and it's it, it, you, you, you know you get a very you, you get a very strong flowering of cultural communism then too and I think our, I mean again we always talk about left review you know as the sort of high watermark of communist cultural Activity, you know, the, the circulation of left review is, you know, it's hard to know, but it's around three or four thousand. It's pretty small. As I said at the beginning, the circulation of a journal like Our Times is 18,000. So, I mean, you know, in terms of the kind of cultural reach and resonance of the party, its high point comes not really in the 30s, but in the 40s. But then obviously, 
you know, the moment that we, we start to move into the Cold War, then, you know, that very quickly, that formation, that very rich formation is very quickly under immense pressure and starts to break up, you know, rather rapidly. But even beyond then, elements of it, I think, are carried, carried forward and sustained. Okay, well, thank you very much, all of you, for having contributed to this, but obviously, particular thanks to Ben for uh, his time and his expertise. As he said, we do, we are lucky enough to have a copy of the book here, and we are back open, our reading room is back open, so if you want to book an appointment to come and have a read of it, we would be delighted to share it with you. Um, and although we are sorry that we couldn't hold this event in person, we have had 86 people here, which would be far more than we could have fitted in our annex. So there are some plus points to uh, to, to online-ness, as it were. Uh, ben, I will send you through the chat file so that you can see the appreciation that people have, have offered you, even if uh, even if it had to be typed rather than a, the warm round of applause, which you most certainly be, be getting at, at this point. So next week, Wednesday the 12th of May at the same time, we welcome Hazel Kent, who will speak to us about conscientious objector Ben of Rockway, and we hope you can join us. This talk has been recorded too, and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel shortly. That's at youtube.com forward slash WCM library. A reminder that our talks are as usual free. However, we would like to encourage you to support the library if you're able to do so, and there is a donate button on our website. Thanks again and goodbye until the same time next week. Take care, in solidarity, very best wishes from all at the Working Class Movement Library. Thank goodbye. you, Lynette. Bye.